Good evening, and welcome to the San Francisco Open Mic Poetry Podcast TV Show. I'm Joan Gelfand, and my guest tonight is Clara Sue. Welcome, Clara. Thank you, Joan. And we are talking tonight because Clara has a new book, Translations of the Tao Te Ching. We're very excited. It's a beautiful new book, and Clara is going to read in Mandarin. No, in Cantonese, actually. In Cantonese, yes. and I'm going to read in English so that you will... Of, of the translation. Be clear what the poems are. Clara, with over 250 translations in publication of the Tao Te Ching, why did you decide to translate this book again? Um, translation is a, I found is a very personal exercise. And so reading other people's translation is not the same as going into it myself, because then you find out that um, translation actually is quite subjective. And everybody put in their philosophy, their thinking, their interpretation. Um, and when I did it for myself, and really I did this translation for myself, I learned to question a lot of the interpretation, the, the usage of words, um, and I feel that I am much more closer to the Tao and I have a deeper understanding of what um, it's, you know, it's about. So on a personal level, it is very gratifying to do a translation um, Absolutely. of the Tao. And uh, what I did was I not only translated the text, but I, whatever the text trigger, uh, me in thinking about um, a, a poem that I've written a long time ago or to stimulate me into writing a new poem, I put the poem side by side with the text. Just, um, I don't know, it just, it's, to me it, it, is, it is something that is old and something that's new, Absolutely. putting together. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's a beautiful thing, that's something that is old can inspire something, something new. new. Yes. And these poems that are yours are very fresh. Thank you. And so let's share with our audience. Okay. All right. So um, the first one is page 30. Number 12. 第十二章. 五色令人目盲 the five colors blind the eyes. The five tones deafen the ears. The five flavors cloy the palate. Rushing about hunting makes one's heart go mad. Rare goods cause shady activities. The sage serves the abdomen and not the eyes. Therefore, leave those and take this. Huzza! shouts the splendiferous queen, watching her offspring emerge, swarming the surface, sucking nutrients, growing big, becoming vicious, killing each other for her attention. Woohoo! A winner! She roars, super, and bites off his head. <laughs> <laughs> We have some spiders involved mm. there, yes. Okay. The next one is um, page Yeah, 162. I've got 162, yeah. This is passage 76. Mm-hmm. 第七十六章 人之生也柔弱其死也堅強萬物草木之生 
也由脆，其死也孤高。故坚强者死之徒，柔弱者生之徒。是以兵强则不胜，木强则共，强大处下，柔弱处上。Seventy-six. When alive, man's body is soft and yielding. When dead, it is hard and rigid. When alive, ten thousand vegetations are tender and delicate. When dead, they are dry and withered. Therefore, the tough and strong ones are disciples of death. The soft. And weak ones are disciples of life. Therefore, an aggrandized army does not excel. A hardy wood will be possessed. The big and strong are placed low. The soft and weak are placed high. Diane. The rabbi's graveside instruction was very clear. Al makomo yavo yav shalom. Using the spade, he shoveled earth onto the coffin three times, then put the spade backward in the earth for the next mourner. Andrea, shaking, could not bear to bury her father. Each shovel a mark of finality. Little Eli, ashen-faced, held tight his mother's hand. He would never put dirt on grandfather, even if they said he is dead. Mourners lined up under the fierce Los Angeles sun, bound by a tightness, purposeful, silent, took up the shovels. Diane, was it you who first broke the silence, going up to each person, thanking them for coming? Alan, Alan, his name on your lips. Alan, Alan, his name on our lips. As people conversed, the tightness loosened around the pile of earth, the gaping hole, the ritual for the dead. It was then that the children appeared to finish what the adults had left unfinished. One pinky girl and several boys, calling each other in their young voices, stood on the mound and began to shuffle. Little Eli, sweaty head, ran up and down, spade in hand. Pushed and dragged and kicked the soil with his shoes, filling the emptiness in front of him with a fire that burned brighter than the sun. Death is no more, Diane. Its sting broke under the burst of energy. Only memories of Alan remained, beautiful, vibrant, loving, a gift. That only life can give. Stillness is breath in the valley of the wind. This last one is number fifty-six, page one twenty. The seventy-sixth chapter. 知者不言，言者不知。失其锐，闭其门，错其锐，解其分，和其光，同其尘，是为圆同。不可得而亲，不可得而疏，不可得而利，不可得而害，不可得而归，不可得。而戰，故為天下貴。Fifty-six. Those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. 
Stop that exchange. Close that door. Blunt that sharpness. Untangle that dispute. Blend that light. Be like dust. This is called mysterious likeness. It cannot be attained and made dear. Cannot be attained and be estranged. Cannot be attained and be profitable. Cannot be attained and be harmful. Cannot be attained and be noble. Cannot be attained and be lowly. Therefore, it is precious under heaven. Sometimes five minutes. Minute. Meal. Sometimes five minutes. A puddle of muddy water. Sometimes five minutes. Brain itch. Therefore, the sage accepts this five minutes. Even if it feels like 25. Laughs at its absurdity. Weeps at its longevity. A mere parsley worm. Can it not leave a trail? Therefore, be brief when it comes to speaking. Be concise when it comes to writing. Those who follow this won't need another five minutes. Lovely. Thank you so much, Joan. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. And good night from the San Francisco Poetry Open Hotel. Mic. Open Mic. Podcast. Podcast. TV. TV. Show. Show. Hello, this is the San Francisco Open Mic Poetry Podcast TV show with Clara Sue and John Rhodes. And uh, in my segment, uh, we have uh, Lucille Langday. And Luc Lucille Langday is, is an East Bay poet uh, in the Bay Area. She has published uh, 10 poetry collections and chapbooks and uh, won all sorts of awards. Um, she also runs Scarlet Tanninger Books. Uh, she publishes a lot of the East Bay Poets. And um, what would you ha say about your, your poetry um, in a brief statement, Lucille? OK. Um, I write poems on many different themes and topics, including science and nature. And I thought that tonight, um, I would read some of my science and nature poems um, because uh, both the arts and the sciences are uh, currently under attack by the administration in Washington, D.C. And there's a very high probability that in the near future funding will be cut um, for the arts and sciences. Um, some programs will even be eliminated. And I think that this is a very bad idea. And so I thought that I wanted to um, honor the arts and sciences tonight um, and express my belief in their importance by reading poems that have to do with scientific uh, issues and findings. OK, well, uh, thank you, uh, Lucy. And we'll cut this clip, and then we'll have you read your poetry. Good? OK. Good. <laughs> um, the contributions of women to science have often been underappreciated or even unknown. So I thought I'd start out by reading a poem about two women and their contributions to astronomy. It's called Homage to Henrietta Swan Levitt and Annie Jump Cannon. The first computers 
spinsters who scanned photographic plates at Harvard College Observatory in the late 19th century, recording the colors and brightness of stars in fine Victorian script. Barred from taking classes and earning a degree, one woman could catalog 500,000 stars in a lifetime betrothed to the universe. An ordinary person might have cursed all the elements in the spectra. Their work considered too menial for an astronomer, the women knew the sky more intimately than anyone. Henrietta's world was Cepheid variable stars. She watched them day after day, growing dimmer and brighter through weeks and seasons, grains of salt on dark plates, until the sky told her, the brighter the star, the longer the cycle will take. And she showed the way to measure distances between galaxies, even light years from Earth, to the edge of space. Every fact is a valuable factor in the mighty whole, Annie said, and she told the astronomers how to classify stars by temperature and color. Oh, be a f g k m. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, the students would say, missing the irony. And the blue-white, white, and yellow-white stars beat like pale hearts millions of light years away. The yellow, orange, and red ones, colder, were closer now, familiar as lemons, oranges, and apples glowing on the breakfast table in a black lacquer bowl. Um, so these women did incredibly important work in astronomy, and they really had the job title computer. And they did work that today is, been, been, is being done by electronic computers in scanning uh, the photographic plates from the big observatories. And this poem is from my collection of science and nature poems, Infinities. So uh, I'll le read one more poem from this collection, and it's called Fear of Science. I have no fear of Dolly, whose genes came from the nucleus of a starved mammary cell, or of tomatoes sprayed with gamma rays to kill maggots, worms, and salmonella, or of mice whose mutant myosin disrupts the alignment of muscle fibers in the heart. Nor do I fear the frog and carrot cloned from mature cells long ago or the outdoors where cosmic rays bombard my DNA and radon gas emerges from the earth, or people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy whose heart cells are in disarray. Should I fear grain stacks where chlorophyll molecules capture light in an oak leaf, or the sunbeam itself dancing photons arriving after a long journey through space, or the beat of my own heart squeezing blood one way through its four chambers. I don't even fear the way neutrons from a uranium nucleus cause fission of a second nucleus, changing mass to energy, making a chain reaction possible, and certainly not the electrical signals traveling like thoughts through silicon chips. What I fear is the imperfection of the human brain, quick to anger, oblivious to the needs of frogs and carrots, mice, oak, sheep, confused by too much or too little dopamine, unable to remember clearly the color of man root, the cry of geese. So I do think that it's the human brain we need to be afraid of with its great capacity for anger and um, vengeance and greed and things like that. Uh, now I'll read one poem from my collection, um, The Curvature of Blue, which also contains uh, a number of science and nature poems. And the poem I'll read from this collection is called Letter to Send in a Space Capsule. 
And this poem is addressed to intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe, millions of light years in the future. I lived on the third planet circling an ordinary star at the edge of a spiral galaxy two million light years from the Andromeda Nebula. We called it Earth. In spring, the mock cherry trees were flocked with white blossoms when maples blazed green and hummingbirds with long, narrow beaks and brilliant throats sucked nectar from red and orange flowers. In summer, the sky was pale blue and sometimes feathered with clouds like the wings of giant swans. When our star, known as the sun, was at its peak, the pavement of our streets began to sizzle, forming black tar beads and ice cream sweet and sticky dripped from children's cones. As the earth tipped away from the sun, maple trees turned red, liquid ambers gold, and falling leaves swirled in every gust of wind. When no leaves clung to the trees, the year's final season arrived like a bride adorning the world with ice and white lace. The planet was mostly covered with oceans and filled with great basins surrounding continents and islands that rose green and lush from the radiant water that surged and frothed at every shore. I was born 20 centuries after the birth of a prophet. Many considered the son of the creator of the earth, the heavens, and everything living. My species, Homo sapiens, was one of many warm-blooded creatures with four limbs, a backbone, and enamel teeth. Our brains were large, and we figured out how to shatter atoms and even fuse nuclei releasing energy like the heart of a star. We built enough nuclear bombs to incinerate or irradiate all life and fill the atmosphere with ash. Needless to say, most people didn't want to use them, but we spoke many languages and lived by different customs, and nations that couldn't reach agreement often waged war. As we burned fossil fuels to run our factories and cut down forests to build our towering cities, the earth grew warmer, the air turned grayer, and the polar ice caps crumbled into the sea. One by one, flowers, frogs, worms, and birds began to disappear. It may sound strange, but most people cared deeply about the planet and each other. This is what I know. The language in which I write is English, a strongly stressed Indo-European tongue with regional variations and peculiar spelling. I hope the clapper rail with its brown and white striped belly still inhabits the salt marsh, and the scarlet bugler still blooms each spring in the coastal hills of California, my home. I hope the rain still falls on fields and rivers. I hope you can decipher this code. And the, uh, the last poem I'll read is from my chapbook, uh, Dreaming of Sunflowers, Museum Poems, which was co-winner of the 2014 Blue Light Poetry Prize. And, and, and the t as the subtitle implies, all of the poems in this book were inspired by my visits to museums and historical sites. And the one I'll read is called Behind the Scenes at the Museum, and this takes place at the Science Museum of Minnesota. A science museum, big as a factory, as much underground as above, wide white basement hallways, fabrication rooms, stored collections. A giant door leads to a gallery of room-sized vaults where temperature, humidity, and light are controlled. In one, shelves hold jars of creatures floating and fixative, shrimp, crabs, mice, fetal mountain goats. Another has drawers of insects, a huge butterfly with blue iridescent wings, a stick bug one foot long from South America. 
a whole vault for dinosaur bones, another where a bison skeleton has been assembled and blessed by tribal elders, more treasures, a fossil tortoise 350,000 years old, a bald eagle, its white tail and brown wings spread in a drawer, earrings of shiny green beetle wings and a necklace of small birds from Peru. From the plains, beaded moccasins and dresses, samples of corn, miniature ears, red or brown, more than 100 years old, more nutritious and tasty, the curator says, than corn today. Some corn now exists only here, but the museum is planting seeds to give the corn back to the tribes who gave it to early anthropologists who couldn't give them back their land but at least thought to save the sacred corn. Thank you. <laughs>